Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Attorney McGinnis. Uh, last night, when I was thinking about what I was going to say to you this morning, it occurred to me what this case is really about. It is about a mother's worst nightmare. It is about a mother being taken away from her children in life or in death. It is about Petros, Theodore, Christiane, Constantine, and Noel, who went to bed on May 24th not knowing where their mother was, and she has still not arrived. That's what this case is about. And so the question becomes, who is responsible for Jennifer Dulos' death? Now, the defense in their closing argument suggested a couple of different things to you. On the one hand, they said it's likely that she's dead, thus leaving the possibility open that she's still alive. Do any of you really believe that? The other possibility is that Fotis Dulos is this monstrous murderer. And still a third possibility that Fotis Dulos wasn't responsible, but Jennifer Dulos is dead nonetheless. But what you didn't hear a lot about in the closing argument from the defense was about Hartford Brunt and the dump of the evidence. You didn't hear much about that. Very tangentially, they addressed it. I pose this question to you. Do any of you doubt that Fotis Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife? Do any of you doubt that he was in New Canaan on May 24th, 2019, murdering his wife? How else would he have had her bloody bra, her bloody shirt, blood all over the bags, his DNA in a glove found inside the trash? How? And so when the defense suggests that to you, I suggest that's not reasonable. And so, once you conclude that Mr. Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife, you then go to the next questions, which are, is this defendant legally responsible for her death? Is this defendant legally responsible for conspiring to tamper with evidence, for acting as an accessory to tamper with evidence? Was the defendant motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos. I want you to make no mistake about this. This defendant hated Jennifer Dulos. She referred to her as a bitch who should be buried next to the dog. Now, I'm just gonna say this because we're gonna talk about Mr. Gumiani in a few moments. The defense is trying to have it both ways. Disbelieve Mr. Gumiani about that, but believe him about the remark the following week. We'll talk about that. She had animus towards Jennifer Dulos. Even in her interviews, you heard it. And by the way, you're going to have the interviews. So you don't have to take my word for it. She referred to Jennifer Dulos as a manipulator. She said, you people are toxic, referring to Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos. She said that since she moved to Connecticut, it had been two years of torture. She even admitted, if you caught it, that she demanded that Fotis Dulos go to therapy with her because of Jennifer Dulos. Everything was not okay. And when the defense gets up here and they say to you, well, the report, everything was going so well, there was no motive, Fotis didn't have a motive, Michelle didn't have a motive, think about what she actually said about that report for a second. Jennifer is trying to manipulate you, Fotis. Stick with the courts. She has borderline personality disorder. So even after the report came out, this defendant didn't buy it. This defendant didn't think everything was going to be okay. This defendant needed to go to therapy to see how Jennifer Dulos being in her life was going to impact her future. And so when they say that there was no motive, when they say that there's no evidence that Michelle 
to commit this crime, I submit to you that is completely contrary to the evidence. And I also just want to say this, and I don't quite know where this fits in. That's for you guys as the fact finders to decide. There's something unsettling about the defendant and Mr. Dulos fooling around on the passenger side of that Tacoma on May 24th, 2019. And you'll recall that from the third interview. And where that fits into all this, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. The defendant in this case repeatedly lied to investigators. Repeatedly lied to investigators. What does that say about her culpability? What does that say about what she knew in advance? What does that say about what she knew was going to happen to Jennifer Dulos and what she knew they did after the fact? So let's run through some of the things the defendant said to investigators. I showered with Fotis Dulos on May 24, 2019. I, I was Now, here's what's interesting about that. She is giving the investigators an awful lot of detail, isn't she? I didn't wet my hair. Fotis jumped in the shower with me. And of course, we know where that came from. This is what she told investigators about where Fotis Dulos was on the morning of May 24, 2019. I saw Fotis talking to Kent in the office. Um, I Kent and Lewis there. Yeah. They're talking in the further argument in the house, no? Just explain. Just explain. Um, they're in, in the table, not the office. You, they, Kent and who? And Fox is Kent and Fox. Um, I, I brought my computer. I... All these details. He's talking to Kent at the table in the office. I grabbed my computer. You know he's in New Canaan murdering his wife. You know that because of all the evidence, the DNA evidence, the trash in Hartford. So what is she talking about? I didn't see Fotis' phone in the morning on the 24th. She told investigators she didn't see the phone. She told investigators she saw Fotis in the shower. She told investigators she saw Fotis talking to Kent Malin. Until she didn't. Wait, I actually didn't see him. Didn't see him as the investigators get more evidence and she sits down for a third and final interview. Now all of a sudden she didn't see him. Wait, I actually did see his phone. And incidentally, I just happened to answer the one phone call that he had in his timeline. The phone call that he set up the night before. Now, I am just going to say this. Her lies were so profound that the defense brought in two experts to try to explain them away to you. And what I suggest to you about those experts is, number one, Dr. Loftus couldn't point to a single thing, not one thing, in this record that the police officers fed her. 
Not one. So when the defense attorney gets up and says, you'll see in the report authority figures, I asked her on cross-examination, did the officer suggest that? I don't recall. Did the officer suggest that? No. Not one thing. And it's interesting, too. We talk about language proficiency. We talk about why she may have said the things that she said. I'm going to tell you exactly why, members of the jury, you should reject that. If that's really the case, she has memory lapses. She has false implanted memories. She doesn't speak the language. If that's really what's going on, why is she so good on details that don't matter? And so bad on details that incriminate her? Why? How does she know she bought parsley at Stop and Shop? She even told the police, if you'll recall and you watched the interview, that when she went up to Starbucks, she tried to order a chocolate croissant and they were out. That's the kind of detail that she provided. And yet when it comes to things that incriminate her, language gap, memory gap, you exercise your common sense. You're smart people. You get it. This is not reasonable. Here's the thing about the lies also. She doubled down on it, didn't she? When Detective Clabby told her during that first interview that Fotis Doulos had murdered his wife, after that, she went back to, I saw him in the house. She doubled down on these lies. In her second interview, she said she never read Fotis Doulos' timeline. That's interesting, isn't it? Because his timeline, you'll recall, notes the call from Greece notes the call from Andreas because it was designed to be an alibi for him, just like she was. And as you know, that phone call was arranged the night before. This defendant was undoubtedly part of this plan to kill Jennifer Dulos. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The cops asked her, why wasn't Hartford in your timeline? Oh, I was going to write that, but I got interrupted. Isn't that a coincidence? Isn't that convenient? Speaking of that, you heard the defense talk about Kent Mawinney. The evidence is, is that when that phone call came in, what did Kent Mawinney say to the defendant in her own words? Does anyone remember? Is this the call? The call. Isn't that strange? Freudian slip. You only have to find that the defendant conspired with one other person to find her guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. And it's obvious here that she conspired with Mr. Dulos. She was part of his alibi while he was in McCain and murdering his wife. In the second interview, she told investigators that Mr. Dulos hadn't told her what to write in her timeline. But by the time we get to the third interview, he told her. So you think about that. Why is someone who is innocent lying so much? That's a question for you to answer. Now, I want you to also think about 80 Mountain Spring Road and the timing of everything. Why would Mr. Dulos, and again, the evidence is overwhelming that he murdered his wife. So why would Mr. Dulos invite her to 80 Mountain Spring Road to clean the house while he's cleaning the Tacoma that you know was involved in this crime, unless she was involved. Why would she bring cleaning supplies? Think about it for one second. I want you to just think about that. Fotis Dulles has said, while I clean blood out of a Tacoma from my estranged wife's death, can you clean the house? Is that reasonable? To say nothing of the fact that she completely omitted the Tacoma from her first two interviews. Why was that? Why wasn't the Tacoma mentioned? Why wasn't that brown stained paper towel mentioned during the first two interviews? <clears throat> also, think about how the defendant described going to 80 Mountain Spring Road. She says that initially, Fotis Duos called her to bring cleaning supplies. She kind of is distancing herself from what was going on down there. But you know that they actually went together. And it's not until she's pressed that she admits that they went together. And it's corroborated by the surveillance footage. Hey. Hey, bring the team some guys mm -hmm. hey, for to clean the house. Okay. For Randy. Okay. That's 
more or less what I remember. And he called me like at one fifteen something, and he called me like at three. Uh, well, let me just tell you that at one thirty-three, Fotis is driving to Jefferson or uh, driving to Knox Spring, and by one thirty-six, you guys are both arriving in the Knox Spring. Okay, so I went with that thing and stuff. Okay, but you went with him. You guys are both driving into the driveway together, together, like literally right one right behind the other. went together. So you say, well, Attorney McGinnis, that was just an innocent memory lapse, no harm, no foul. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that. Why would the defendant go to 80 Mountain when you know that this cleanup is going on? Think about what the defendant brought to 80 Mountain and what was later found in the trash. Oh. And you remember what the bag Yeah. So it got cut off, but they were asking her what the color of the sponge was. And she said yellow and green. What color sponge was found in the trash in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos' blood and DNA on it? What type of bags were found in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos' blood and DNA in them? with Jennifer Dulos' bloody bra and shirt in them. Think about the fires. Three separate fires on the afternoon of May 24th, 2019. None of those made the timeline. Just like Hartford didn't make the timeline. Just like the Keys didn't make the timeline. Who's lighting a fire on Memorial Day weekend? Better question, who's lighting three fires on the Friday before Memorial Day weekend on a day like that? The fact is, is that she lit three separate fires at a time, and you know with certainty that the cleanup of Jennifer Dulos' murder is going on. And the phone data shows that she was at the house by herself. Her admissions show that she was at the house by herself lighting those fires. The surveillance shows her going back and forth repeatedly. Five minutes at a time, nine minutes at a time, fire, fire. She's not involved. Pavel Gumian, one person ran towards the Tacoma, embraced it, and another one avoided the Tacoma. And you guys will recall that image that the defense admitted into evidence where Pavel Lumiani is at the police department with oil looking to get his vehicle back. Does that sound like somebody that was involved in this murder? Everything that Mr. Lumiani said to you was corroborated by video surveillance, the infotainment system, the gas receipt. There's even surveillance footage of him leaving with the dirt bike in the back of his vehicle. You guys will recall that. You'll remember that there was only one exhibit, I believe, during the trial that I actually physically handed you, and it was the surveillance shot because it was difficult to see with the plank in the back. You guys will recall that. Everything he said was corroborated by the surveillance footage. Everything. And by the way, if you're going to have the temerity in closing argument to accuse someone of being involved in a murder, at least have the brass to ask them when they're here on cross-examination. Objection, Your Honor. Well, at this point, the court can appreciate Phyllis' argument, but ad hominem attacks. You can say great. Neither should they. Gumiani stood an entire day of cross-examination, an entire day of cross-examination, and he stood up to it.
She picked him up. Her phone number was used. That's hindering. That's accessory to tampering with evidence. I want to just talk to you now, because the evidence in this case has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I want to just pose these questions to you as you head into your deliberations. Is it really just a bunch of coincidences? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered Dulos' phone at Fort Jefferson Crossing when he was murdering his wife in New Canaan? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos' phone is being moved and manipulated when, the, when only the defendant is home? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought cleaning supplies to 80 Mountain Spring Road where you know the cleanup of this home was going on? Is it just a coincidence that the call from Greece is not in the defendant's timeline? Is it just a coincidence that during the cleanup, only hours after Jennifer is murdered, the defendant is shuttling back and forth between Fort Jefferson and 80 Mountain Spring Road? Is it just a coincidence during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a second fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant eventually lights a third fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that while Dulos is cleaning the Tacoma, she takes a brown stained paper towel from him and throws it in the trash? Is it just a coincidence that despite no one telling her to, she took the keys to the Tacoma? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant travels with Dulos to Hartford as he disposes of the evidence on the same day? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought black garbage bags to 80 Mountain and Jennifer's shirt and bra were found inside black trash bags? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a green and yellow sponge to 80 Mountain Spring Road and two of those were found in the trash in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a broom and the police found a mop or a broom handle in the trash at Albany Avenue in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant opened the door to the Raptor at the exact moment that Dulos exits the vehicle to dump those license plates in the sewer and block that other vehicle's view? Is it just a coincidence that despite her daughter not being home, the defendant panicked when the police came to the house, went to three separate rooms and said, I don't want to be here? By the way, if the police come to someone's door while their child is not home, would you expect a reasonable person to immediately go to the door and make sure the child is okay? Unless, of course, that person just knowingly committed a crime. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant followed photos to the car wash and then tried to lie about it? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's phone number and not Dulos's number was used at the car wash? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied and said she showered with Dulos when he was actually en route to murder his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about seeing Dulos in the office again while he was in New Canaan murdering his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant initially denied seeing Dulos's phone on the morning that Jennifer was murdered? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant said she saw Dulos meeting with Kent Mawinney at Fort Jefferson Crossing around the time of Jennifer's murder, the same information that was in Dulos' timeline? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned starting a fire to the police until they confronted her in the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to mention that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned that Dulos had washed the Tacoma during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered the one call mentioned in Dulos' timeline on that morning as having been answered by him on the morning of his wife's murder? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to tell police that Fotis Dulos' bicycle was at 80 Mountain Spring Road until the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about not going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to return those keys? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos told the Bell Committee to keep the defendant, quote, out of this when the committee brought up the defendant taking his keys? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's DNA was found on the opening of a garbage bag that also contained blood stains, tape, and Jennifer Dulos' DNA? Are all these things just coincidences? Or is the defendant guilty? Now, during voir dire, we asked each of you, if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, would you be able to come out here and find the defendant guilty in open court? And each of you promised us that you could. We've done that. We've met our burden of proof in this case. 
Now, I want to show you, and I have two minutes left here, the timelines. One last time, we're going to talk about these timelines. Now, Fotosis is to the left, the defendant's timelines are to the right. And they have been referred to as timelines, but they were really just a script, weren't they? And maybe some of you remember from English class in high school, every script has three acts, doesn't it? The first act was the premeditation and killing of Jennifer Dulos. The second act was the cover-up through the destruction of evidence and the defendant's lies. And now we've reached the third act, except she doesn't get to write it. You do. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the closing arguments in the matter of State of Connecticut versus Michelle Traconis. The court will instruct you on the law, but the court will do that after the lunch and recess. That instruction will take about 50 minutes. Because the instruction will take that much time, what the court has decided to do is give each one of you a complete copy of the instruction so that you can follow along Otherwise, it would be difficult to digest those instructions as the court is reading it and you are trying to listen. We will stand in our lunch and recess. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not talk to anyone about the case. And we plan to see you at 2 o'clock.